now it's the turn to say welcome to Johanne Gode from Norway. And we are going to listen when you have some short presentation of your master thesis. Yeah. Thank you. you the Thanks. scene is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. My name is Johanna Dubig Gode. And uh, I've written a master, a master thesis that I just uh, handed in in uh, this summer. And this is what I'm going to, talk to, going to talk about. So this is the title. A communicative encounter between a fluent signer and a youngster with uh, congenital deaf blindness. And how uh, the knowledge of sign language can be a benefit in interaction with uh, a person with uh, CDB. So what made me interested in writing about the subject is, uh, you know, what is language and how can sign language, uh, you know, I, I have sign language as a first language and how can, it, can it be a benefit for me? So, uh, and I'm very interested in atypical communication. I think it's very interesting and really exciting. So uh, congenital deaf blindness, I've been working there, working with them in uh, for five years. And uh, yeah, and... Uh, and there are actually not that many people working there who has sign language as their first language, or they can sign, but not that very well. So uh, that's why I thought it would be exciting just to see, you know, to be a part of uh, the, the persons working with uh, deaf uh, and blind, congenital deaf and blind, see what happens. Um, so I wanted to be something, you know, contribute to something that is bigger than myself, and. Uh, uh, we know that uh, communicating, communication is fundamental for all people, uh, for, everybody, for, for everybody. So belonging and uh, the, that feeling of being safe and social interaction, this is what other people, this is central for everybody. Everybody needs that. So to have, it's, it's about having uh, access and uh, accessibility. So the background for my uh, master thesis was uh, this uh, boy. He was 15 year old, years old, and he's born deaf and blind. Uh, he was uh, he got surgery to get a cochlear implant, but never really used it. Uh, and I was told that he uh, is using only his face as a signing space, and I've been tell, told as well that he doesn't really like to to use his hands when he's communicating and that he's using a lot of gestures. Uh, so I saw that he was using a lot of, uh, a lot his body in the room, his body in the room. And I, uh, so I started to film a, a meeting, a normal meeting with him where we were just me and him. I didn't plan anything, I didn't have any theme or any activities, I was just filming the, the, the uh, just filming the situation and it lasted for three and a half minutes and uh, the only two signs I could understand from what that encounter was the sign for father and the sign for up. And uh, so in that situation, I only understood two signs, but there was a lot of gestures there. So it was interesting to see afterwards on the film how much I can understand after having looking at it. Uh, so the conversation, conversation hands, as you can see on the pictures, that he's signing in my hands and I'm using his hands. And you can see that the boy as well uh, is uh, taking my hands. I has, he has his hands above mine. And uh, as I said, you know, uh, that's a way of listening. And he can actually guide my hands. If I didn't understand what he said, you know, he, he can actually use my hands uh, and, and guide them. Yeah. He was using his body as well uh, a lot. Uh, he was kind of moving it and putting his back towards me. Uh, this is him deciding to put his back towards me. That's, that's one of the things he was doing, positioning his body. So, here you can see that uh, the boy is moving physically in, in the room, uh, lying down on the floor and using signs at the same time and uh, using yeah, the, the floor as well. Yes. So to sum up, uh, when I, I was looking at the videos, uh, I, look, I actually saw 53 utterances, uh, but I understood only two uh, there and 
uh, there and then. So I saw that he had different... Uh, I, I wanted to look at the meaning of the, all those utterances. Uh, so I used four different analytical tools uh, so that I could actually see what's happening in the discussion, in the, in the dialogue. And I was using one tool, which is called uh, one model, which is called Six Spaces, uh, Six Spacer, and uh, trying to find uh, the different. Uh, uh, the, what? what I, uh, different themes. Uh, yeah, it's based on different themes. The, the this model. So I was looking at the real, uh, real space as well uh, as a, a, an analysis. And I use all those models and uh, tools to be able to understand the, the, the whole picture, the whole situation. situation. And uh, I was trying to, so that I could understand how, what he was trying to say. He was using the, the, the floor to communicate. He was using different things. And it's not only about what he does with his hands or what he does with his body, but the way he was turning his body towards me, the way he was using a blanket, for example, to tell me different things. So I actually understood only two signs of all those 53 utterances, the sign for father and the sign for up, but what about the rest? Um, and afterwards, after using this six spacer, I can actually have a picture that you can look at. Um, you have the memory space, which is over there, up, up there. And the father told me, uh, I actually, the father of the child told me that he used to scratch his back uh, before. Uh, and uh, and uh, base space uh, is what we know. So it was the boy, me, and the two signs that I knew, and the fact that he was pointing at his back. Um, and then we have uh, the relevance, re relevance space uh, and the reference space dad in the, that in the past in the, in the, in, the, in a particular way scratching pointing at, uh, pointing at the back so the, 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 that was the sign that the boy was using and so pointing at his back and uh, re uh, relevance as well uh, that I want. This is something that I want. And when you have the blend, which is kind of the blend of all the, 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 the other space, it actually was ready to say, can you scratch me the way daddy does? So, yeah, can you scratch me the way daddy does? That was kind of the, the significance of it uh, after we, we, we blend all the spaces. So that was my hypothesis after I started to look at the video. Uh, I could actually, uh, after an analyzing it with the different tools, uh, and after talking to the father, we could uh, actually confirm confirmed my uh, theory, my hypothesis, that uh, here, yeah, that's what he wanted to do. Uh, he wanted to do the same thing that he was uh, used to do at home with his dad. So he actually, to show me, he was actually playing the whole thing with his body, acting, constructing a scene, and trying to show what's happening home uh, using the signs, like father, uh, because he doesn't really have any, many signs to be able to, to explain everything. So he was actually using um, a blanket that he found in the room, and he was actually playing it, showing me that it's like when I'm lying in bed with my father. Yeah. So now we are going to the real space analysis that I've uh, started to, to talk about. Um, So the thing that we have to, uh, to, to, to see all those utterances as communication. Uh, they are actually saying many things, and uh, we, we should see those as, uh, as important and to get uh, kind of the whole picture, to understand the whole picture. Because the, the, the way they're using the room, the way he's using his body, the, the direction, the position of his body, he's actually trying to uh, say, explain something that he, uh, he uh, experienced. Uh, so that's what, uh, yeah. So if I'm going back to the, the, if it's a benefit for me to be able to uh, to uh, to have sign language as a, as a, as my first language, 
when I was filming it. Uh, you can see that in the beginning, as I, I was explaining, I, I couldn't understand everything, but uh, the, the way the signs that he was using with me in my hands, that's quite, quite kind of the signs that I could actually see, but I didn't understand everything in addition to everything. So uh, the boy was saying father, he was using the sign father, this I understood. And the, the way he was using the blanket and the putting it on himself, covering him. So at first I thought he was talking about the bathroom because it looks, it could look actually the, like the sign for bathroom, but but actually the, the, the way he was using hands on, on his body is uh, the way his father was greeting him, just putting his hands on his torso and just rubbing it. So uh, that's w the way his father was greeting him. Hi, how are you doing? And kind of moving his hands on his body. So, so and he, he was actually using very few signs. Uh, he, he was trying to explain the situation through several signs. Yeah, he was trying to refer to his, to his father by using this sign that looked like bathroom for me, but he was actually trying to show me how his father is greeting him. So he was trying to tell me in different ways how uh, he was how uh, that he was talking about his father. So the thing about having sign language as a first language, the the, the knowledge I have about sign language. Uh, you know, this in sign language, one sign can have actually different meanings. Like, for example, this sign, if you can repeat it so that I can translate, sign, this is the sign for knife. And twice like that, it's signed for dinner. Uh, and the uh, my aunt, aunt, for example, could be the same thing. So, or it could be uh, like metal or uh, egg, it can be different signs. But the sign is pretty much the same. It really depends on the context different meanings in the signs. So it's pretty much the same with deaf and blind. Uh, uh, they can have different meanings in one sign. Uh, so it's kind of really important to see the whole picture and not really, you know, only focus on one sign, on one thing. We're trying to, to, to connect the dots and think about different uh, so several things in the same time. Yeah, that was it actually. So do you have any questions? This was a bit short. Uh, thank you. Uh, but I just wonder, could you explain a little bit more about how you started the analysis of the sequence? Just how, how did you uh, find out that he was using the whole, the whole, uh, a much bigger signing space than his face? Yeah. How I found out? Do you mean? Yeah. How how did you? Uh, how 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 was he using? What was his? If you think about signing space, you said to begin with that we thought maybe. To begin with, his signing space was mostly in his face. Yeah. But you found out something else. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, when we uh, started to communicate with him, uh, first I heard that uh, uh, yeah, w w when I started to co communicate with him in the, in the room, so uh, many times we uh, we uh, we were talking about. Uh, we're talking about the same theme, uh, so I went in and out the room, uh, and uh, and we're actually moving physically, moving from one place to another one. So when uh, when we were filming, he actually sat in that kind of big uh, soft chair, sakosek in Norwegian, uh, um, and then uh, we actually moved to the chair, and he moved on the on the floor. But every time he would just went back to that theme. Uh, the, the, what he was talking about, the, the, the topic. So, not really depending uh, de depending on where we were, he was still recurring, uh, recurringly talking about that uh, that uh, that t uh, topic. And uh, in addition to that, so uh, we saw that uh, he was really active very often. He was. Uh, coming and, get, and getting me. Uh, you can see that in the video. And 
and uh, always referring to the to the to the discussion, to the dialogue. So, Johanna, you mean that his different signing spaces related to what he was talking about? Yeah, yeah. In what way? Well, um, he, uh, like I said, first, uh, when we were moving, he, he, he moved onto the floor and uh, he was... He was mapping, uh, w mapping the floor, and uh, in his story, to, in his story, he was using the floor as a bed. So he was using the room uh, concretely, just to, get to have a concrete pl place where he can just uh, try to express himself in different ways. So he was using the, the the floor as the bed, and he was using things around the room, uh, like artifacts, to be able to uh, express himself, trying to uh, to to to. Make put through what he was trying to, 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 to tell me. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, do you hear me? Yeah. OK, this is a question from Liz Hodge. She has two questions, actually. Hi, Johanna. Thank you. A very interesting presentation. Can you be more precise about the advantage, advantage of being a native signer? Yeah, what kind of benefits do I have from uh, being a native signer? Yeah, well, um, I think that uh, it can be an advantage, it can be beneficial, but I'm not saying that it is. It's a theory that I have, but I think that Knowledge, sign language knowledge, uh, uh, it could be another person, it doesn't have to be a native speaker, it can be a, 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 an interpreter or another person learning the language, but the, the fact that you're looking at the language in a visual way uh, uh, could be beneficial when you're talking to a congenital deaf person because it's... Uh, Yeah, because they're using their body uh, when they're trying to express themselves. So, uh, so for us, you know, they're using their whole body. So we are kind of used to see that. You know, we used to see communication in, in a visual way. So we can maybe uh, discover different things that other people will not see. You know, uh, oh, this sign does it mean this? Like for example, I was saying with the with bathroom, for example, or to bathe. This sign, it's actually you know, he was talking about his father, but you know, the the like this. He was not using the sign for his father. He was using another sign for his father. So signs can have different meanings, and just to be uh, yeah, to be used to see that in daily daily life can be a benef beneficial for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the second part of the, her question is: What would no, sorry? What wouldn't have been recognized by someone who wasn't a signer? Do you think? Well, yeah. in this film, uh, uh, you don't have any other. I, I haven't showed. In this film, there is no no nobody's there who uh, who who doesn't know any sign language. But so I don't know really if I can answer it, uh, regarding this movie. But uh, it can be possible that they would not be able to recognize a sign, but uh, there are a couple of partners who actually know the, the person who is, who is congenital deaf and blind better and they kind of understand their language anyway. But, uh, but I'm, I'm thinking, when I'm thinking about sign language, uh, especially about uh, in the context, um, uh, well, the, the, the way we answer and uh, uh, what can I say? Or the the way we see science, uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, a person with sign language knowledge has, a, I think, has a big advantage when we are looking into science, looking at the person signing to understand the person with congenital deafness. 
Yeah, do you have more questions? Yes. Uh, first, uh, I want to ask you if you can say something more about the benefit of using the six spacer model. Did you find it useful uh, as a tool, etc.? Yeah, um, I think it was uh, yeah, it was very beneficial for me to use this kind of tool. Uh, get an overview of uh, of the different components, the different spaces, uh, uh, like the memory space and uh, the reference space, and then and uh, it's kind of better to to build up to your hypothesis, so you can kind of show back to those spaces and uh, the, all the information you're getting there. So, for example, for the yeah. Like the father in the memory space, when he was asking me, like telling me about the fact that he was scratching his bed, he used to do it, kind of laying in the bed and doing it. I can actually maybe find the pictures. Do you want me to bring back the picture? Yeah. You remember it? All right. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I think that uh, I think it was beneficial for me to use it. I really uh, had a, it was a good thing to understand for to understand how uh, how communication can be better and. Uh, and uh, yeah, in the actually as well, um, it's, uh, it's yeah. So you can see here in the model, especially for deaf and blind, uh, congenital deaf and blind, uh, Oscar Loschen, who uh, actually made this model, uh, uh, connected the model to this and uh, to, to deaf and blind and uh, the way we are communicating. So we have the before we had only five uh, spaces. But uh, because we have deaf and blind, we had to add the memory space uh, to be able to understand what, uh, yeah, the the the, bod the bodily uh, bodily utterances. Like Yaron uh, was saying, when uh, you're grabbing the arm, about you know, uh, it's about blood pressure. You have to remember. You have to know the story. You have to you have to have some background to be able to understand what he was talking about. So um, you will not understand it only from the sign alone. You will have to have the the knowledge. Uh, about the memory of that person, of what, what they experienced. So I think this one was really important, the memory space and the, the whole tool to be able to, to have uh, in, my, uh, in my concrete space. In the, the real space analysis of the words, so it was, uh, they were kind of playing each other good, those, uh, uh, the, those models. Uh, so they were, they, yeah, they were, yeah. Supporting each other, those models I was using the six spacer and the real blend, uh, the real space blend model. Well, it's uh, two more questions from Lilia Liston. Um, she say, "I appreciate absolutely the advantage you have as a fluent signer. Do you feel being a fluent signer inhibit your ability to understand the person with congenital deafblindness?" Well, <laughs> I personally don't think so. Uh, well, but uh, but I don't think that uh, you only need sign language uh, knowledge to be able to work with deaf and blind people. You have to have more knowledge about different things. And uh, of course, when you're working with congenital deaf and blind, but. Uh, I'm not saying that everybody who is fluent in sign language can actually work really easily with deaf and blind, congenital deaf and blind people. It's not what I'm saying. So uh, it could be vice versa. You know, it could be uh, a person who is uh, signing a little bit, but he's who is very, very good in uh, in uh, in communicating with deaf and blind person, and you can have the other way as well. Who a person would be very good in signing, but doesn't have the knowledge to work with deaf and blind people. So I'm not. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you're personally interested as well, it, it changes the whole picture, of course. Yeah, and then um, I think you maybe answered her last uh, part of the question also. Is it necessary to be a signer to be able to support a CDB person to develop her communication? So. Um. Like I said, you know, um, some persons who don't know how to sign, they will still be a very good partner. They will manage to develop language and uh, communication with a person. But uh, if you have sign language, I'm 
really sure that it makes it easier that you have something, you have a base, it's easier enough to to uh, to understand the science and to uh, to interact with the person and uh, with a deaf and blind person. So it's it's easier maybe to just go into it when you know already the science. It's uh, but if you can't, if you don't know the science, it might be a little bit more difficult, take a little bit more time, and oh, what can I say here, or how can I do that? Wait, I have to think a little bit. Uh, maybe I just have to create one sign, and let's see if it goes, I don't know. It's a bit, uh, It's. I don't think it's as easy, as accessible, as uh, uh, when, when it comes to a bodily uh, and tactile um, communication. And she just wants to moderate her first question a wee bit um, because she meant to say, did you sometimes feel inhibited? <laughs> and it, uh, uh, do you feel being affluent? The first one was, um, um, do you feel being a fluent signer inhibited your ability? But she moderated and did you sometimes feel inhibited? So, well. Okay, I see. Okay, sorry. Yeah, it's me again. Um, when you talk about the uh, six space, or also when you talk about the real space blend, yeah, can you say something more about that, please? The real space blend. Yeah, well, um, uh, real space plan uh, uh, analysis um, is, uh, it's kind of, you have to treat all the, the utterances that are being, to, are being said as communicative. Uh, like I said, 53 of those in the, the short video of three and a half minutes. But uh, you have to see the whole picture. You have really to see the whole situation and all the components in the in situation that the boy was using the floor, was using the chair, was using his body, to kind of turning him, his body towards me, his back towards me. So everything that he's using in the space, everything that he's doing, how he uh, expresses, the, the, the way he expresses everything, uh, the way he was orienti or or orienting his himself in the room as well, and uh, the, the way he was using the floor, the blankets, and everything that he had access to uh, gives a bigger potential for him to express himself. So I, I really like to see this on the like to see this on the video because the, the real space blend analysis gives a lot of. Uh, you can see that by looking into this, looking at the real space, you actually can see that he is telling much more than we think. He was acting to uh, to uh, to to tell the story and re kind of retell us how it is at home and uh, uh, because he was you know we were filming him at this housing facility and uh, so so he was you know just trying to uh, to um, to to show a memory from his home so so we never saw that in the same way so he's uh, yeah he was actually using the floor and uh, using all, everything around him to be able to show that to us to me. Yeah, thank you, Anna. It's very interesting uh, to see uh, when you're showing us how one can take something from the memory uh, and take that memory into the here and now space that you are, which is a different space than at home, uh, and see how we can use the surroundings uh, as requisites uh, for your utterances. Uh, when you were uh, describing, uh, your thesis uh, and this uh, film you are talking about. Uh, I was also uh, thinking about um, the categories that I talked about uh, and how they also just the categories, the language categories uh, I was talking about uh, and just started placing them on top of that again uh, in my own head. And that was quite interesting. Uh, the way you talked, he used the blanket. Uh, or the duvet, uh, how he's mimic mimicking uh, bed and making a sign for bed. Uh, the way the sign you perceive as bathing sign, which is the greeting ritual of his father, uh, and how he like makes the bodily emotional trace from that. So it's yeah, it was quite interesting to see. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
Will anything more? I wonder, um, you learned something from this analysis, I presume. Uh, since you uh, understood to begin with, with your sign language background, only two out of uh, 53 utterances from having analyzed this. Could, uh, would you do something differently or did you learn something that could make you relate differently in a new situation? Yeah. Well, of course, I learned something. Uh, I learned that uh, next time I'm, I'm meeting this boy, I should see more. I, look, I should look more broadly uh, uh, at his sign space. Uh, uh, I should kind of use the starting point. You know, uh, if you know, he, the, the way he's expressing everything with his body tactile, that was kind of one of the things I was focusing on before. But I learned a lot, uh, of course. Uh, from the theory I was reading and uh, the, the, from my studies. Uh, so now I'm much more aware of everything that is around and not only what is produce, being produced directly to me. So uh, yeah, the, the, the signing room, the signing space of the person is definitely something I should, uh, I'm more aware of that I have to look more deeply into when I'm encountering uh, a deafblind person. Okay, um, Jay Harper says, Thank you, Johanna. And Alexander, he has a question. Thanks for the inspiring talk. Would you also say that all behavior is communication? Yeah, yeah I think so. actually that every, every utterance is, uh, is communication. Uh, you can see that he was using uh, using different ways of uh, trying to explain it. He was using the father, he was using uh, 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 the sign for father on the chin, he was using the, the, the sign that looks like bathroom on the... He was using the sign that looks like, for, like bath or bathroom to me, and, uh, and now the interpreter just ruined everything. Yeah, and that... Uh, yeah, the way he was uh, pointing at his back and... Um, yeah. So I actually think that through that analysis, uh, I, sh I should see every utterance, every movement as communicative, and uh, because he's actually trying just to communicate in different ways, in different uh, different modalities, uh, how what he wants to say. So I really should try to kind of yeah, follow everything he was saying, and uh, and even though even when he was orienting himself in the room. Uh, uh, the way he was just going from one place to another one, but uh, he was actually trying to put himself, his body, in a certain position towards me. Just so, even this should be seen as communicative. Everything should be seen as communicative, of, um, unless proved otherwise. Um, I'm just curious, Johanna. Uh, after you have done this research. Uh, I'm wondering how has this influenced you when you're communicating uh, with other persons who are just deaf? Uh, do you feel that you can see their communication in another way? Uh, do you now also look at their way of positioning themselves in the room or using real space plans? Do you see more in the communication now than you did before you did the thesis. So has this given you an extra aspect in how you see communication among your peers who are also deaf? Yeah, I can actually, when I think of it, I learned a lot from this situation, from uh, my thesis. So I'm thinking much more about uh, what deaf and blind do and uh, uh, so uh, that everything that they do actually has a, um, a, a meaning, but uh, but 
you actually was asking me if uh, if it's if I learned from that. Uh, I, I'm thinking uh, when you speak with other persons who are only deaf, not deaf blind, but just deaf persons, do you see their communication in a in a different way now? Do you feel that you can understand new aspects of what they're saying? Is there has this given you a broader view uh, when you're, I mean, perceiving signs and reading signs? So the way you say uh, the one you had on the video, the deaf blind person, uh, when he's using the space, positioning himself, normally we don't I mean we don't make any meaning of that with when you're talking deaf person to deaf person. But has this influenced your way of seeing communication with other persons who are deaf? Well, uh, I never thought of it, actually. Um, uh, but uh, with deaf and blind, I can definitely answer yes, because uh, the feeling that I got a broad view about it. But deaf, I've never actually thought about it before, so I can't really answer you here. I just think it would be interesting uh, half a year from now, if you think about it, so we can just discuss it again and see if uh, you have some new aspects uh, that you see and that you take into the communication due to your study on this thesis. Sure, yeah, why not, yeah. Um, I, mean, I may have another question, but it looks like somebody's writing. No, it's okay. Thank you so much, Johanna. Thank you. It, uh, you made us discuss <laughs> very much. Thank you. And now we have uh, a coffee break. Uh, no, I should say, first I should say, if you want to listen more to Johanna, you really should attend the course about communicative relations in March in Copenhagen. Unfortunately, not uh, translated in English. But um, you can find it on uh, NVC's website the week before Christmas. <laughs> the date is uh, 25th uh, to 28th of March in Copenhagen. And Göran Forsgren and Anna Nafsta is there also. And Johanna and Lynn Shea are going to present there. Thank you, Johanna. And Thank now you. it's time Thank for you. a cup. Yes. <laughs>